Hi, I'm Brian Hickman. I am a member of the piano faculty at the Center for Musical Arts. I would like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the five piano concertos of Beethoven. Before I talk directly about his concertos, I would like to first explain what exactly is a concerto. Now, a concerto during the time of Beethoven was a large musical work, uh, usually uh, set for a single instrument or a group of solo instruments pitted against an orchestra, a larger group. Concertos were thought of as contests or, or duels between the soloists and the orchestra. And, uh, and so this, this, this contrast, this, it, it was a point of interest for the, for the concerto. And this, is, this contrast was used by composers to great dramatic effect. First movements were generally in sonata allegro form, a uh, sonata allegro form that's been expanded enough so that it makes room for both an orchestra and a solo instrument. And in the sonata allegro form, you'd have the exposition where the thematic material is presented, and there's also key relationships between the, the thematic ideas. You have the development where those thematic ideas were, they are taken and they are expanded upon, they are reworked, they are played with in such a way to build drama through the changing of keys, through the changing of rhythms or whatever, in order to build excitement. And, and then it goes into the recapitulation where there is a return to the tonic key of the movement. And there all of the thematic ideas that were presented at the beginning are presented again, and this time all in the same key. Towards the end of that recapitulation, you will hear the orchestra pause. And at that point, we enter into a cadenza, which is a, a section where the soloist plays alone and they are playing either a previously composed or improvised passage that makes use of the uh, thematic and rhythmic material that was presented earlier in the movement. After the cadenza, the, the movement comes soon to a close after that. Second movements are usually simpler in structure and relatively short compared to the outer movements. And the last movement is typically a rondo or it is a uh, theme in variations or something along that line uh, where there is a lively dance-like rhythm. The thematic ideas of the, uh, of the third movement are generally lighter. They're not as heavy and weighty as the, the ones in the first movement. Now, the concertos of Beethoven can be, again, divided into two groups, where one is a, uh, one group is the early concertos, and you have the later concertos. The early concertos are the first three, and then, of course, four and five are the later ones. Concertos one through three, uh, the, uh, the first one that was composed was the, actually the second one to be published, which was the one in B-flat. And it was written around 1785 and was revised afterwards uh, in 1798 as well as in 1801. The concerto in C major was actually the one that was composed second, even though it was published first. And this one was composed in 1795 to 1796 and completed in 1798. And then the concerto number no. three in C minor was uh, composed in 1800 or around that time. And the final form was finally um, published in 1802. So the B flat concerto, which is the Opus 19, which is, it gives a nod to Mozart. Uh, it was scored in a similar way, the same key as Mozart's final concerto, his K595. Uh, this, so this, this was the starting point for Beethoven. And this particular, Concerto follows Mozart's lead in respect to formal outlines of a concerto, the balance between the solo instrument and the orchestra, as well as uh, the certain style of piano writing. Uh, it, it, it has those, that, those similar features. Now, the popular cadenza for this particular movement was composed much later in 1808, and Beethoven decided to add it at that time. The features of, uh, of the opening movement are unmistakably Beethoven style though. So you have an improvisatory entrance of the piano in the first movement. 
you have the octave doubling of melodies, you have bold key changes and uh, dramatic changes in dynamics, as well as unique rhythmic and harmonic figurations for the piano. The second movement is filled, is, uh, filled with carefully thought out um, ornamentation, which creates a feeling of improvisation. And then the third movement is a reminiscent of Haydn and Mozart. It has a very playful themes and very playful rhythms, as, as well as in syncopations, and is actually a very wonderful and very exciting uh, uh, movement to listen to. The concerto in C major, the Opus 15, was actually scored for a slightly larger orchestra that included other instruments, such as the clarinets, trumpets, timpani, and brass, drums, it was more ceremonial in character. And the main theme was written in the key of C. And then the secondary theme, the contrasting theme, was in the key of E flat, which is distantly related to the key of C. And so the octave leap of the main theme is joined with the descending scale of the secondary theme to create the closing theme of this first movement. The middle movement of this concerto is a largo in the key of A flat. Uh, it was just chromatic, it's a chromatically altered median, submedian to the C major scale or C major key. And this character is more intimate. It's more like chamber music than orchestral music. And it's quite a lovely movement. Uh, the interaction of the cantabile lines of the clarinet is, is interesting to note the interaction of the clarinets and the piano, lyrical piano lines in this movement. So it's worth paying attention to. The third movement is a rondo, which is marked allegro scherzando. It's brilliant in character, and it has a, uh, a feeling of a playfulness that is quite infectious. Now, the concerto in C minor was one that was written at the height of Beethoven's career, and uh, uh, it was uh, didn't come even though it was written around the year 1800. It wasn't in its fixed form until about 1802. And then the piano part wasn't really fully written out until 1804, so it, it had its own um, development as well uh, over time. So its first performance was uh, the 5th of April, 1803, at the Theater Andervein. And the character of this particular concerto is one of forceful vigor. It, it really grabs you from the very beginning, and uh, that C minor theme comes comes in with the orchestra and then once once the piano enters in a little later in, in the first movement it enters in with these introductory scales three three to be exact uh, and it and this particular entry is actually repeated a few times throughout this movement and it's no noteworthy this movement is noteworthy because of the unexpected ways the soloists and the orchestra interact there are unusual dynamics, there are unexpected harmonies, and the soloist actually continues to play after the cadenza. And so that was something that was very uncommon at the time. The second movement, which is Largo, is Beethoven's most extensive and highly decorated slow movement. And of the concertos, this is his most highly decorated one, his slow movement. In the key, it's in the key of E major, which is the raised median of C minor. Again, very distantly related. So, so it's an interesting harmonic um, relationship there. Now the third movement, the rondo, very boisterous in character, and it opens up with the piano playing a single G as it enters into its thematic ideas. But that G actually creates this tension between that the harmonies um, of the piano in the third movement the, is the, the, the last chord of the second movement has a G sharp and then the first note in the third movement has a G which creates this tension which Beethoven uh, uses and he plays on that tension throughout this movement and it happens several times. Now of the later concertos you have the Concertorum G major with the Opus 58 which is uh, composed of around 1804 to 1806, and the first performance was given in March of 1807 with the composer as soloist. 
The, this particular concerto is Beethoven's most poetic, it's his most lyrical. It has uh, several very unusual characteristics and features. The first movement opens with the piano unaccompanied, which is probably unheard of before this time. And it has five measures of unaccompanied uh, melody, and, and then the orchestra comes in in a different key. Uh, it's, so that, that was an unusual feature. The, there was the appearance of a theme in A minor, which was unexpected. And that was after there was a sense that this movement or this, this music was going to go to the key of B flat, but it didn't. It went to A minor. And then it goes through a series of other key changes to the key of F sharp. And then there is this mixture of harmonies you'll hear at the, at the end of the opening ritornello. You'll hear this, this harmony of um, this dominant seventh harmony over a tonic pedal. So, so it creates this, this tension there. Now, there's also the, the, the early entry of, of the piano at the beginning of the development section. Uh, and this rhythmic motive that it has, it, it states it and, and moves the movement quickly into the key of D minor. And then when you get to the recapitulation, you're, you find that there are um, key changes in the, in the recapitulation, which is something that was also uh, unheard of before this time. The second movement was an andante con moto. It's very unique. It's in the key of E minor. But the thing that was very unique about this movement is that there is no set musical structure for this. Uh, there is, it seems to evoke an operatic-like scenario between the orchestra and the soloist. So you will hear these forceful dotted rhythms in the orchestra contrasted with the cantabile character of the piano. And, this, and then there is a miniature, miniature cadenza that leads to the final movement. The third movement, Vivace, is a rondo that begins without pause be uh, between the second and third movements. And it begins with the orchestra making its opening statement in the key of C, followed by the piano in the same key, and then, and then, and then it's off from there. And the rondo is very playful and rhythmic with plenty of virtuosic display. So it's very, very, very fun to listen to. So it's one of my favorites of the, of the concertos. Now, the concerto number five in E-flat major is the, known as the Emperor. It is Beethoven's most ambitious work, and it is, has a lot of virtuosic display. Even from the very beginning, the piano is brought to the fore of this musical work. It was first, uh, well, it was completed in 1809 and first com performed in 1812. Uh, the first movement has these opening statement in the opening chords that make a very bold statement, and then there's an improvisatory passages played over those chords by the piano. As the, and this goes on, and then the ritornello of the orchestra uh, states five theme thematic ideas that are be, to be treated by the orchestra by the concerto in this movement. Uh, Beethoven uses several techniques that are also present in the fourth concerto in this fifth concerto. So there's the, of course, the unconventional interactions between the orchestra and the piano. You have bold key changes, modulations, and, and the recapitulation, and there's also the piano present throughout the end, to the end of the movement. The second movement, the adagio on Pocomoso, in the key of B major, the distant key to E flat. It's improvisatory like passages that are in the piano, there are also delicate muted strings. It's a lovely movement, but it's brief. It's not very long. At the end of the movement, the composer begins to hint at the coming, um, at the coming third movement by kind of giving you traces of the thematic material that is going to be presented in movement three. And then the third movement is an allegro, is a rondo, and the theme is majestic. And it, it starts without a pause between the second and third movement. The theme is, is majestic. It's syncopated in 6-8 time. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and I, it's one of my, also one of my favorites of the movements in these, in these concertos. Uh, my final thoughts about these concertos is that uh, the Beethoven's concertos do hold a certain special place in the, in the development of the concerto as a musical form because they mark the point 
in the development of the concerto where they started to move away from some of the classical principles and ideals that previously shaped the concerto. And through the use of distant key relationships, through uh, experimentation with musical structure, through experimentation with new ways of soloists and or orchestras interacting, and also the substantial use of virtuosic writing for the solo instrument, uh, Beethoven pointed a way forward for 19th century composers to explore new dimensions in the composition of concertos.